Hello, guys. Welcome back for a brand new Saturday live stream. I am especially excited for today's show because I asked you guys last week, should I bring guests on the show? And then Rick Samoris was kind enough to give me a whole string of guests. And you know what? I am determined to go through that list because Rick came up with an A plus list, including this first person right here, who I am so excited to chat with today. Everyone say hello to Wendy Lee. What's up, Wendy? Hello. I missed you so much. I am so happy to see you. Hold on one second. I'm hearing like two different things. So I'm going to shut all my other windows. Ah, uh, there we go. Um, uh, wow. Hi. It's been a minute, Perry. Yeah. It's, well, we, uh, I miss you. We, we Zoomed or Skyped a little while ago, but I feel like it's, I don't know. It's so easy to fall out of those habits once you've done it and then like, you don't do it again quickly enough. Something it like feels that. like it's been years, and I know it has not been that long since no. uh, we've talked, but we've both been trying to stay busy, and I've been keeping up with, like, everything you're doing, so I'm just happy I get to, like, chat with you on a Saturday morning. I also want to note that we're somehow, it was not planned, but we're both wearing a version of green. <laughs> so, and also, <laughs> like, with this gold stuff, so you could totally tell right now that I'm back in, like, my childhood room, because I'm wearing a Panic at the Disco t-shirt right now. Yes. Um, not that's awesome I do like panic at the disco still to this day very very much but i was like a big fan when i was younger and i went to one of their shows and i bought this oh my god amazing i you love panic know what at that disco. symbol on your sweatshirt is it's loki oh oh wow it's a little, it's a little l <sighs> you have the coolest stuff like you're you're the definition of like a pro. I've said this to you before, a pro at geek chic, where it's <gasps> like, like my favorite type of geek wear is when like, you know what it is, but someone has to do a double take to figure it out. I love it. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, my closet is, uh, I have a growing collection of geek stuff and uh, I'm trying to be really smart with my money. I know May 4th is coming up on Monday. I already know oh, one no. thing that I'm going to buy and I feel like that might be the only thing that I buy because I just I just can't. <laughs> I can't indulge in the May 4th buying situation all that much because I've already I've bought a couple of, you know, too expensive things. So the first thing I had to buy, which is when I flew to New York, I obviously didn't take my external hard drives with me. And when you work on a laptop, your your computer fills up with mm -hmm. video files really quick. So I had to order one of those. Yeah. And I got this microphone right here because my 10 year old Zoom recorder decided it's it's over and done. Oh, no. Right now. So I bought a microphone. But on top of that, for these streams. I also found that, because I brought my camera with me, mm -hmm. that camera, I, I don't know, there's something about the, the camera and the link up to the computer that wasn't working right. So I finally just splurged and got a Mevo. <gasps> yeah. Whoa. And it, the funny thing is, I'm not going to order anything on May the 4th, but it arrives on May the 4th. <laughs> So, so it's kind of it's the force at work. Oh well, yeah, I feel like yeah. I still get to celebrate. Uh, so fill fill everyone in right now. What are what are you up to right now? How are you spending your days? Uh, well, indoors, <laughs> except for taking out the dogs. So basically, it's a lot of content building for the movie couple and Geek and Glitter yes. right now. More so for the movie couple. So we're trying to do a video a day, which is not easy uh, because sometimes I'll have things in the can and I'll just go ahead and release it so then I can focus on other, you know, stuff that I need to do at home, whether it's cleaning or doing stuff for Geek and Glitter. But then I forget that I am now run out of content that's going to upload and I have to scramble and now my entire day is kind of like filled with making videos and editing and doing this and then I forget to eat and I was like, oh, why am I grumpy? So... It's kind of like a rinse and repeat cycle where I forget that I've like run out of things that I've shot and then I have to shoot more. And then we're trying to go live every Wednesday and Saturday um, at 2 p.m. PT. So um, just trying to make sure that like we have everything set and ready to go, which you understand sometimes you're you know it's going to happen and you're still somehow not like technically like prepared or you're one of your things go down and you're just like, I don't know what to do right now. Yes. Yes. I've been there way too often. <laughs> it's like, 
it, like it's incredible how I can have, you know, let's say with the crypto quote videos that I've been doing, like I have a whole week to prepare for those, but then then it's like Wednesday. And I realize that if I don't record it by the end of the day, Wednesday, I can't record it early enough on Thursday to have it ready to go by 12 and I'm freaking out all over again. Oh my, and you're up at 3 a.m. You can't sleep and you're just like, I, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of terrible. There's been a little of that and I have been guilty of exactly what you just said where I get so caught up in something that I'm working on that I'll forget to eat. And then you're like mad, right? You're just like, I. Why am I angry? Um, What's the I, food menu like in in Ask Wendy? Uh, we are, and it's because of me. It's not really because of Dustin, but I've become so paranoid about um not t doing takeout. Um, just because it just makes yeah. me feel better, like that I'm handling my own food. So it's just kind of a cycle of what I always can make. So aside from like the really easy stuff like spaghetti, um, Dustin's pulled out the crock pot. So we actually had barbecue pulled pork for like a few days because you know you just make a whole bunch. Um, we've made beef stew, which is now is too hot for that. We've made Japanese curry, which I love. Um, there's been like homemade pizza and tuna sandwiches and spaghetti, more spaghetti. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. A lot of like baked chicken, salmon, and tilapia. This sounds really good it actually I, I was i've been kind of surprised at my cooking skills because i'm just kind of like well what can i cobble together because you know you start running out of food mm -hmm. and you're not ready to go back to the store yet so you're just like okay i'll just see what i can make with this and i was like well hopefully it tastes good and then i make it and it actually looks good and then i put it in my mouth and i'm like oh i feel like okay you could guess at least one thing that i've been eating regularly just just guess one thing are you gonna say eggs no, I actually, I haven't been doing that. I haven't been oh, doing good. That. Um, no. Is it homemade or is it takeout? It could, it could fall into both categories. I want to say creation, but I know you don't have that no. where you are right now. But, but you are semi right about that because- By Chloe. One of the last, I wish, I miss by <gasps> Chloe so much. One of the very last things that I did do before leaving out LA and flying home, it's like most of my suitcase was filled with my video equipment and also Dewey stuff. Mm -hmm. but the other thing that was packed in my suitcase was basically as many creation cookies as I was able to afford. <gasps> that supply ran out like four weeks ago and I'm devastated by it. Oh, I wonder if you can order online and have them sent I over. I don't think you can oh why not okay. that'll that'll make them like all the better when i return to la and get to have them again that's true that's all you're gonna eat for like a whole week straight maybe two I weeks you will just go there all the time but i'm i'm still the queen of the microwave i'm i'm very into i eat a lot of microwavable rice mm -hmm. and then i'll make you know like morning star veggie patties i'm very into those those are good i'll, I'll have a lot of that but also uh one of the very few places that my family is still going to regularly is the Starbucks drive through And I, oh, I really like those, those boxes that they make. Yeah. It's like, it, it always tastes good, but it feels like very well balanced. Like I'm getting a little of every food group. Perry, you have no idea how much I actually mix, miss having Starbucks because all the ones around me closed because none of them have a drive through oh. So I'd have to go like five miles plus to, yeah. to get a Starbucks coffee. That's and I was like, that's not cool. worth me driving out it's five miles. Five miles. Apparently yeah. Now. I know, but I'm just like, ah, uh, like the closest store is actually like 1.2 miles away, like a, an, like an actual grocery store. And I was like, what's the point of me driving five miles when I can just drive 1.2? I swear you <laughs> All right, we've got some super chats to get to. One from Chris McGovern, who says, good morning, Perry and Wendy. Great to see you both on the same video again. I couldn't agree more. Before we move on to this next super chat, actually, I I don't know if I've ever actually said this to you verbally, but I think you know it. So the greatest thing about Wendy is that you were exactly what I needed when I first moved to LA. Like I'll never I'll just never forget the very beginning because I was I was so afraid and I was lucky enough that I got to visit the studio twice, I believe, and spend mm -hmm. a good deal of time with you guys before I actually made the move. But like I was lucky enough to be able to move to LA with a job and that's more than most people have. And I feel very fortunate about that. But more importantly was the fact that I walked into an office full of people who I wasn't just working with, but super kind people who were actually my friends. And Aww. I'll never forget that you and the Voipos in particular just 
welcomed me with open arms like no one else and you were so kind and that made all the difference like my first few weeks in LA and also now well beyond. Aw, thanks. I actually still remember the very first time you visited and I was so excited to, not that I was sick of anybody in the office at all, I was just so excited for like kind of like a fresh presence uh you know in the office yeah ladies of collider uh and uh i what i didn't like was that and i think it was just during your visit but you were you know you had such a strong you still do have a very strong work ethic oh, that yeah. like i think other people were we i think it was like end of day we were all leaving and then you were still like typing away your computer and i was like i don't remember who i said it to maybe it was harloff but i was like should we should we stay or should oh. like <laughs> I just felt weird that you were going to be by yourself in this like brand new office and you didn't really know people in LA. No. And then you're gonna, I think I asked you about it and they're like, you're like, no, I'll be okay. I'm like, okay. It's like, it was the interesting transition of being primarily on the collider.com side where like most of, most of my days before moving out to LA, I was like at the computer like this, like this all day for hours and hours and hours. And like, it was a, it was a very good transition, I think, to be more involved in the video team. And, you know, I, like I liked going from working from home to switching and being in an office because I was very nervous about that, too. Yeah. I thought I was going to miss, you know, wearing sweatpants every day and sitting on <laughs> nonstop and doing my own thing. But now that I've had the experience of working in an office with a whole bunch of wonderful people, like, I don't think I could ever go back. And that, that's been very frustrating now for me is not having exposure to people 24 seven, but I don't think I would ever not want to work in an office anymore. I think our office is so unique that, that I hope that when people come in, like the, the anyone new coming in can kind of feel welcome because we're, we're, we're a unique bunch where we're just you know, geek thing, all about geek things. And we like yelling across the room instead of walking to one into the other side of the room to properly communicate with the other human being. But I kind of like that. It makes me feel like it's family as opposed to we're just coworkers. Mm -hmm. um, what, how was it like for you when you first came in and we weren't this like quiet bunch that were all just clacking away on their laptop where we're just kind of like a little rowdy and a little crazy and always like, you know, making noise. It was good. I think it was good because it was, like it always felt like it came from a place of passion and love. It's like, it's not like it was. So basically if I was sitting there writing an article and someone came and interrupted me, it was with something that then I got excited to talk about. I don't know. It, it all, it all just felt so right. And so natural. I still can't believe that I've been in LA for four years. I know. I can't wild? believe it. I, I really still do remember the very first time you came and then like trying to set up your office and your dad came by yeah. to kind of check out the place with you. He's the best. Yeah. I just, I just can't believe it's been four years. And I then know. you used to bring Dewey to the office. Like, yeah. Mm. I don't think he really liked that all that much. <laughs> but we did. I know you guys did. And oh, I miss the Falcor and Navi so much. Yeah, they're, uh, I was, I would pick up Falcor, but he's out of my reach right now. He was coughing a little earlier. Yet, is it like a situation where they're going to have separation anxiety after? Or are they like, oh, why are you still home? I, I think now they've gotten used to us being home all the time so I think when everything reopens and work starts back up again they're gonna definitely have some separation anxiety mm -hmm. um but they they did hit a pocket of time where they're like are you still here can you leave so we can have the house thanks because we see we have cameras for the dogs so um I mean they're regular security cameras that's what, was what we use them for to check up to check in on the dogs and we see what they do when we're not home. And Navi is not normally allowed on the couch. She first thing she does if we're out, she'll just jump on the couch. Of course. <laughs> and she'll have herself like the best dog nap ever. Falcor kind of has a little bit more of anxiety. He'll pace and he'll sit by the front door and then he'll eventually like end up falling asleep somewhere. Oh my god, those babies and the snowflakes so so much. So cute. So for everyone in the chat right now, we're going to take some of your questions. And first, I have to go back to this other super chat from Mike Hill, who says, I miss Krispy Kreme donuts <sighs> most during lockdown. <laughs> I totally I understand that, that Mike. I totally what? Get, like, I, Krispy Kreme donuts are like the best of the best. Yeah. 
Do you think, wait, what is, what's your donut ranking? Oh, no, no. I saw you were, you were going to say no Krispy Kreme. And I was oh, like, no, oh, no. I, th- I thought you were surprised that I, that I was so into them. Oh, no, I, I, he- I heard you. I, uh, I heard you wrong. No, I love Krispy Kreme. They're kind of duking it out for me because I did, okay. I did grow up with Dunkin' Donuts. So, uh, that's, that's kind of up there for me, but I miss the Dunkin' Donuts like on the East coast. The West Coast, sometimes it's still hit or miss. Most of the donuts taste wait, wait. similar. So what? wait, what's, what's so different about West Coast Dunkin' Donuts compared to East Coast? Is it's it just a flavor thing? Yeah, it's the flavor and like the consistency of the of the donut. It's it's just slightly different. And I don't know if it's like maybe a nostalgia at work, but when I when we were like back on the East Coast and I would go to a Dunkin' Donuts, I'm like, yes, this tastes, you know, it's like home. It's like the coffee is good or the hot chocolate's good. The donut's good. And I have it here. Sometimes I'm like, mm, could have gone to Krispy Kreme. <laughs> I think, uh, so when I think about Krispy Kremes and Dunkin' Donuts, I can't believe this is the topic we're going down right now. Like I compare, I compare them to Subway where it's like, you know, how Subway, like, like a sandwich is a sandwich anywhere, but for whatever reason, the the smell and the taste is more distinct at, let's say, a Subway. And I feel the same way about specifically Dunkin' Donuts and Krispy Kreme Donuts. It's like when I have an itch to go get one, it's like that very specific taste that you can't get anywhere else. But yeah. if I had to only have one kind of donut for the rest of my life, I think it would probably be a Krispy Kreme Donut. But it would I have to agree when the, you know, the hot and fresh light is on. Yes. Oh my God. Thank God we have one in Burbank that that that's easily accessible if I choose to go there. I, I obviously haven't, but I know uh, our friend Dorian Parks tweeted about how he was like, oh, I'm going to go to Dunkin' Donuts. And I'm like, oh no, now I want to go to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a whole bunch of chats here. First, I'll hit up Caleb, who is just chiming in as he always does to support us. Caleb, Yay! you know I think you're the best. Thank you so much. And then we have Iman, who oh hey from the Patreon team. I oh my god, I don't know what currency that is. I, I need to to Google that abbreviation. While some people dream of Oscars, my goal is to have a future movie of mine. Oh my god, reviewed by. <gasps> I wow! Just, I kind of like don't even know what to say about that. That means a lot to me. And uh, I, I, like, I don't know what kind of uh, movies you're working on right now, but I, I would love to hear more about your project. So, so do chime in and share more as you develop some stuff. So, congratulations on on anything you're working on, because I really do think that whether whether you're making a feature film or even if you're just kind of you know, getting started on putting pen to paper with a specific story. It's a huge accomplishment. So congratulations on everything you're working on. All right. So as we wait for more questions, we did have one movie news topic that we wanted to discuss a little bit because (laughs) I, I, oh, uh, she chimed in. It's uh, Swedish Krona. Interesting. Ah. Oh, I knew that too. Um, So I miss doing movie talk quite a bit, as you well know when, and I miss mm-hmm. doing shows like that with you. So I wanted to make sure we got to talk about one movie thing right now. And one of the biggest topics out there right now is the battle that's going on between theater chains and studios, specifically at this point in time, Universal, in regards to Universal's uh, statements that imply that they are not going to honor traditional release windows going forward and theaters aren't happy about it. AMC has decided to make a statement that they're not going to screen Universal movies. And while Regal and Cineworld didn't go that far, they did express their frustration with those comments. So, man, Wendy, (laughs) where do you fall on the matter? What are your biggest takeaways? Is this all being blown out of proportion too quickly? Well, I feel like there's a lot of reactionary uh, comments that were made, statements that were made by, by honestly, at first AMC, because I feel like, so Universal, this whole thing started because of a Trolls World Tour, which is like kind of hilarious to me. That's like this like cute, happy movie about trolls that sing and like there's K-pop in, you know, uh, the movie and now now everybody's fighting because of it. Um, I think the knee-jerk reaction from AMC is because we see what's happening 
in with their company. All locations are closed. Most employees are furloughed. I think that even the CEOs have taken a cut in their pay. So you're looking at like, how are they going to survive out of this? And then you hear this news that a major studio is not going to respect that window and they're going to take everything to theaters and VOD day to day. And they are, of course, freaking out. But I think that knee jerk reaction of immediately doing like an open letter um, and I feel like it wasn't really consulted behind the scene. It's a bit reactionary and that's what kind of caused this whole thing to explode. And I hope that once heads cool, they can kind of talk behind the scenes. It doesn't need to play out with the public. Um, they can figure it out. But I do understand. I honestly understand both sides. I understand the frustration that AMC has because they're looking at you know, like they could potentially lose even more money. Um, And this is, I can, I spoken out of frustration and fear for the livelihood of basically their entire career. Um, That movies, when they hit theaters, they're supposed to wait like 90 days. And I don't know what if the whole thing with trolls, like if it was actually talked about or the universe just went on and did it. Now, if they just went on and did it, I can see why AMC would now have that. That's a little bit more justified, I think. Um, But if it was actually talked about and it was, you know, kind of like agreed to be an understanding that, okay, sure, then that open letter needed to happen. Well, not needed to happen. It should have happened behind closed doors and it didn't need to play out this way because now everybody's up in arms and now it's like Team ANC, Team Universal. Um, I do understand both sides. I understand that Trolls made nearly uh, like it was like 95 million or maybe a little bit more just on that title. Um, So the excitement is to, yeah, I'm going to want to bring all my movies, or or almost all, they said they were going to pick and choose, you know, movies that I want to hit VOD and theaters at the same time. The the movie theater is kind of like, well, no, we're not, we're going to lose people because I think people forget that movies theaters don't make money off of the box office opening weekend that goes straight back to the, to the studio. So they make money on the concession. So if you're looking at that, and if you're going to release say let's just say hypothetically a big title like fast nine uh in theaters on vod at the same time there are families that's going to opt to watch it at home because it's going to save them a ton of money Mm. and the theaters will lose out on that yeah i think i think you kind of nailed it just in terms of being able to understand both sides of the equation and also the fact that this whole thing was extremely reactionary and i think these are things that should have been discussed behind closed doors because you know it's a tough time for everybody where everybody's on edge everyone's concerned for their livelihood and the future of the business that maybe they poured their heart and soul into so now isn't the time to make public statements that could get a a rise out of an opposing side but the the big thing i think is that the way that they handled the release of Trolls World Tour, if these statements are accurate to how it all went down, is exactly what you brought up, is that apparently Universal didn't go through the right process in order to alert theater chains that that's what they were doing. I think there's a statement uh, from the folks over at Regal and or Cineworld, I believe it's Cineworld, where, where they said, all our partners called us in a timely manner and told us that in the current situation, they want shortened windows for movies that were already released as cinemas are closing. Most importantly, they all reassured us that there will be no change to their window policy once the cinema business returns. Unfortunately, I missed similar message in Universal's announcement. Not only did Universal pro- provide no co- no uh, commitment for the future window, but Universal was the only studio that tried to take advantage of the current crisis and provide a day and date release of a movie that was not yet released. So I don't blame Universal for releasing Trolls World Tour the way that they did, because the truth of the matter is we're all trying to survive. We're all trying to keep businesses afloat. and. I understand their need to give out content in order to make some money. The problem is if they don't convey the information appropriately to their partners. And the truth of the matter is studios do rely on theater chains and theater chains rely on studios. And I know people are saying that AMC might need Universal more than Universal needs AMC right now. And maybe that is the truth at this given time. But 
things are going to change in the future. And the other part of the problem here is that we don't know how things are going to change in the future. When we all get back to it, it's not going to be like snap your fingers and we're all seeing movies the same way we were before. It's going to be gradual. And then once things get back to some sort of normal, that normal still probably won't be exactly what the normal was before. So we're in a situation where everyone's got to grow and pivot and they better be willing to do so and do so appropriately. Yeah, uh, well, so well spoken because I, I completely agree with you. Like once things reopen, um, we can't just, uh, you know, go back to normal immediately. Like I'm pretty sure those theaters won't be filling up. I know I won't be the first one back. Like I'm going to, you know, once things reopen, I probably would wait and see how yeah. things play out before I let myself go back to the theater. In fact, before this whole thing happened, before we were kind of in like the stay at home orders, the last movie I saw in theaters was um, Invisible Man. And it was like the second week that it was playing in theaters mm -hmm. that I had gone gone to mm -hmm. see it. And I remember being so careful trying to pick a time that it was, you know, least crowded and picking the seats that were kind of further back so people wouldn't like be coughing around me. And there was one person in the theater that coughed through the entire movie, but they were sitting kind of toward cl close to the front. But I was just kind of like, who is that? Who's coughing? Yeah, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're all going to be a hot, on high alert for a while. And it's... Oh, yeah better off that we are because not only do we not want to get sick ourselves but we also don't want to be spreading anything so mm -hmm. if it all amounts to us being more vigilant keeping our distance encouraging everyone to actually wash their hands more often than they were before all right yeah. let's do it guys all right <laughs> let's do a live chat question here we've got a super chat from mm -hmm. g cars with a great question here love you both stay safe if you could make a three movie marathon, any movie from any time to relaunch the opening of theaters, what would they be? Oh, so Ooh. wait, here's here's a follow up question. Do we go down the route of the three movie marathon being movies that had their releases pushed that we want to get it going with? Or are we talking about movies that had come out before? And we want to kind of like reinvigorate that excitement about Ooh. going to the big screen. Oh boy. Ooh. Okay, this is a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. So if we're going the route of like just picking a movie that would have been released in theaters or have been released in theaters before and we're trying to reignite everybody's excitement for theater experiences... Um, so this is like, you know, not like an original movie, just is something that we've all seen before. I would probably, does it have to be a trilogy or can it be any three movies? I, th I think it can be any three movies. Oh, I mean, it's it would be easy to could just go the Avengers route yeah. and do that. So I'm not going to take the easy route. I will pick three independent movies, uh, not indie movies, but three yeah. independent of any sort of major storyline. I would actually pick the first Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Because I love that movie to death. You to go that route. I like it. Yeah, I love that movie. I would pick, uh, ooh, I kind of want to go with a horror movie. I probably would go with Cabin in the Woods. Ooh, yes. I like, I like. And then a third one, I would do a, probably a Princess Bride, because I love that movie too much. Nice assortment. All right, yeah. so if I'm going to play that game and go with uh, older releases that I think could serve the purpose of reinvigorating everybody's appreciation for seeing a movie on the big screen again. I would need a little bit of variety so that we can include all quadr quadrants here. I'm going to go Jurassic Park. For yes. obvious reasons, I'm obsessed, but I also think that is the definition of a big screen spectacle that will capture everyone's imaginations all over again. I think I need to include a family-friendly animated movie, and I'm definitely going to veer towards Pixar on that. And as much as I want to give the spot to my favorite, which is Inside Out, I think I'd rather go the classic route and either do Toy Story or Finding Nemo. I think I'm going to go Toy Story. Let's, let's keep it with like the OGs. And then I have one more slot here. And I feel like, I feel like I should go some, go with something a little more adult. I want to do horror. I think I'll go The Shining. Ooh, good one. I'm really satisfied with our with our triplets here. Yeah, I like just, it. Just briefly, if you were going with releases that were pushed back that you were excited about, what three would you pick? Oh, wow. Uh, Mulan. 
Of course, yes. Uh, but I, I feel like I kind of cheat because I already saw it. I know. Uh, 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 Black Widow. Wait, yes. no, that's not, would have been, uh, would it have been out yet? It's only May 2nd. Yeah. I think it was, it was like recent, very, like the other day that it would have come out or something. I saw someone post oh. about that. So Mulan, Black Widow, that's two Disney films. Okay. Uh, so I'm just trying to think of, my my God, what other movies were going to release in the theaters? Uh, I mean, I was kind of curious about Lovebirds. But we're going to get Lovebirds. Yeah, on we're getting that on Netflix. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. looking forward to covering that at South By, so I'm excited that it's actually coming out now. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll again, mix it up genre-wise. I'm definitely keeping Black Widow because I was insanely excited for that movie. So I'm keeping Black Widow. I will also, even though it's still technically on the release calendar, it's bound to move. I'll throw in Tenet because mm -hmm. another one oh, I'm very excited about. That's going to be so good. And then you know I'm not going to leave the horror slot empty on this one. And I'm going to say Spiral. Give me those. Th and I know Spiral Ooh. has a new date now. Give me those three movies back to back to back when theaters reopen. Yeah. All right. You ready for another question here? Let's do it. We've got one from Raw Nation. Hope you both are hanging in there during this. I met you both in my Chucky Finster cosplay. I fully remember you. That was A plus cosplay a few years ago, and I miss seeing you all on Collider. That it was at a con, wasn't it? I, I think I think I met him at New York Comic Con because I'm pretty sure we met in the convention area. But then I feel like I remember this Ellis's show after. I don't know. So that, that could have been New York or San Diego. That was New York for me, but that like that that night was so like fuzzy for me that <laughs> putting it in a different year for all I know. I, but but <laughs> I will I will always approve of any uh, '90s Nickelodeon cosplay. Oh my god, amazing! Uh, scrolling down here, hey hey, Ed Douglas. Do you think a Jurassic Park series for Peacock would be possible or too costly a la Game of Thrones? I have all the feelings about this topic. <laughs> um, I actually think it wouldn't be too costly. And I think the proof that we have of that is Battle of Big Rock. I think right there is a perfect pilot slash proof of concept for a Jurassic series where... You know, obviously, I don't know what's going to happen in Jurassic World Dominion, and that could change what's viable from a story perspective in a Jurassic TV series. But let's say it takes place in between the events of Fallen Kingdom and Dominion when dinosaurs have gotten out into, into the public. I think what could be great is an anthology-styled series where you have, like, let's say the family at Big Rock, but then you have another family having an encounter, maybe not with a violent dinosaur, but with something friendly. <laughs> maybe someone takes a bite <laughs> in the head. There are just so many interesting things to explore, so I actually think this could be a good one. Yeah, I would love to see a, a Jurassic Park on for TV. Um, and, and I think instead of doing like a regular TV season, I think they if they opted for more of a shorter like mini series season, um, I think it could be better because I'm just thinking about the storyline and the CGI and how it, if you if you release it like a normal TV season, so like twenty some episodes, it could get. I don't know. I just I'm scared that it would get stale, and I don't. I would never want that for any sort of like Jurassic Park yeah. related content. But if you do a limited series, then it could be like real good. And I would love nothing more than seeing like velociraptors chasing people down the street. <laughs> Tis the risk you run with expanding any franchise. And that's that's like, as much as I'm always rooting for more original content, I also really like the challenge of trying to make more out of something that was beloved before. There's, there's real creative challenges in that too. All right, we're going back to Mike Hill. Do you have any idea who holds the rights to Namor? I asked Campia, but he has no idea. Do you know? Apparently it's complicated. I've I've got no idea either. And I don't know, there, there's a lot of uh, interesting rights situations out there where it's not black and white and super clear. So I'm not entirely sure where, uh, where that one falls. Apologies for not having an answer for you, Mike, but... Now that you put it on my radar, I'll keep an eye out for more information. I assume you don't have the the inside scoop on that one, Wen. No, I don't think so. I've been kind of confused about it because it, it and it, and it, that kind of happens when, you know, like Marvel writes, it's kind of like, is it Disney? Is it considered like something else? Because you can kind of look at the Spider-Man situation where it is a Marvel character. So 
but it's not really Disney because it's still Sony. So it's, it's a whole thing, and I don't think we ever gotten sort of like any sort of concrete answer as to, you know, that property. To add, add to the rights confusion, then you have situations like the Universal theme parks where all of a sudden they can use, like, they can use Marvel characters. It's so confusing. It's so yeah, confusing. exactly. And only the ones in Florida because uh, Universal in yeah. LA don't have that. I want to go back to the Orlando parks so, so bad. bad. I want to go to Disney World more than you know. I just want I really to miss it. World. Ugh, but when the time is right. Yes. Are there are other more important things to deal with right now. Like <laughs> that question from Nate Dogs 212. Review movies at midnight. A good thing or earlier? Like as in as in, should I review a midnight movie right after seeing it at midnight? Because that that is like a legit Ooh. question that comes into play whenever we go to cover film festivals. And you know, you know Matt Donato, right? When mm -hmm. so Matt Donato is the absolute king of seeing a midnight movie at let's say a South by in an Alamo draft house where he's drinking beer, then he'll leave that movie at like two, three o'clock in the morning, go and write the review, somehow write a really good review and then be done with it. Wow. Wow. He does, he does tell me though, that he'll always, he'll write the draft and he'll always like sleep on it and wait until he can reread it in the morning. But like that guy works so much after like midnight movie hours and on beers. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I don't know if I have that capacity to like, after seeing a movie and kind of sit down and, and pen out a review right away. Uh, I feel like I would need to sleep on it. But and I, can, I guess in a way he kind of does if he's drafting it and then kind of taking a look back. But I also knowing Matt, I feel like he's kind of like, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and then sending it. I've been there and done it before. But it's not something I like to do. The The one vivid memory I have of working insane hours for a midnight movie was when Halloween, 2018 Halloween, premiered at TIFF. So I went and I saw it. And I got out and it was super late. Got back to the Airbnb. First, I think I started by shooting and editing the video review that we did with Jeff Snyder. Oh, my God. <laughs> Watch that video. We're, like, legit sitting. I think we're sitting on Scott Mance's bed in the Airbnb. <laughs> was the only way to fit us both in the frame and have lighting it was ridiculous but shot and edited that then i switched gears and i wrote the written review for collider.com i think i went to bed at something like maybe six in the morning and then had to get up at eight in the morning to go do junket interviews the next day and it was it was brutal no. it was, oh my god there that's was a lot of coffee rough. to be had the next day that's uh, rough wow we got a little something for you when from caleb I share Wendy's fear of clowns. How are you able to handle the killer clowns maze? We uh, have maze. That's amazing. That's uh. So that was from the good old uh, Collider Live uh, show where we took mm -hmm. Josh McCuga to the theme park. Um, and like Perry, I wish you came with us. I know. It was. It was fun because it was that was a day where I was kind of like, oh, I, I want to go and, and help because, you know, that's like my stomping ground. I'm from Universal theme parks. Like I used to work it, definitely worked the Horror Night scene. So I was all very familiar with the mazes and the people that worked it. And I was like, so who's going to guide Frank backwards in a maze while he's trying to shoot people's reaction? They're all like, oh, I know that one of them would have done it, but they were also kind of playing double duty and they would have been on camera. And I was like, you need a dedicated person to do this. So I went and I just kind of like pulled Frank backwards through a maze. And then Christian's like, hey, let's let's do um, Killer Clown. I was like, okay. And I didn't have a problem with it as long as I was working. So if you, you're going backwards in the maze, you wouldn't be able to really see. And also the scaragers, when they see a camera, they know that you're not trying to scare at the camera. You're trying to scare the people that the camera is shooting at. That's very good. Um, but then they flipped the switch on me and they're like, well, Wendy doesn't like clowns. Let's have her go through it. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. And... The the surprisingly the person the thing that got me through it was Josh McCuga. I don't know because you know Josh is afraid of everything, yes, um, and I'm only afraid of like two three things like spiders and clowns. Okay. Uh, and he held my hand and he pulled me through the maze. He's like, it's okay, it's okay. They're not real. This is okay. And he just kind of cheerleaded me through the entire thing. Um, even though at the end I was like squatting on the floor crying what? <laughs> yeah like I was, I, it was just so much like I so for clowns like they're really creepy 
Um, and with the thing with killer clowns and when you have like the fear of clowns, when they come at you with these crazy masks and very bright colors, it you feel like you're in this like acid tripping dream of clowns like wanting to eat your wow. face off and it's just horrifying. So I think it's it's more intense than like if it was like a Pennywise type of maze and it was just more creepy. I think that I could probably handle pretty well. But the killer clowns, because I've also like not seen the movie to to its end because I won't. Um, really? it, yeah, the fear of it just like really got to me. I was like, no clowns should look like that. <laughs> Period. That's, no, that's, that's fair. Because I wonder if because it's it's a horror comedy that it might be okay. Like if you if you just go into it realizing the point of it is for it to be absolutely ridiculous and silly, yeah, I, don't know. I wouldn't want to expose you to that. It, it breaks my heart enough that that you were like on the ground crying. After that. <laughs> I felt bad for Roxy because she came up and she was like Wendy, <laughs> Wendy with the camera, and then somebody was like, she's actually crying. She's like, oh my god, are oh, you okay? <laughs> that was that was my favorite maze this year. Um, I went back with with Matt one night and we did the. I feel like this is the only way to do uh, Halloween Horror Nights if you're you're uh, like not going for press and you're a paying customer. But like we go big and we get the VIP thing. We do mm-hmm. every single maze in one night. And that yep. one, just the design of it, I thought it was incredible. Hands down one of my favorites. But you mentioned two things and like I immediately went down a different path. One, because you brought up spiders. Do you remember when we found spider in my apartment and then didn't catch it and then have- Did no you find food? it? No. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to tell me the good news. Like, did you find the body? Yeah. I was, I think we were doing like a Dewey photo shoot. So, you know what it probably was? We were probably doing Downton Dewey, found the yes. spider, and then I left for TIFF. So that spider just lived in my apartment when I went off to Toronto. Mm-mm. It freaks me out. That's, it had free reign of your apartment and I hate it. That's the thing that I'm most scared about to come back to LA after all this. I'm really afraid that like there's a spider web or like an intense spider web that I haven't been able to get to. I don't oh, know. Oh gosh. But you don't, I mean, do you often get spiders in your apartment? Yeah, I mean like probably like a normal like bug amount that comes, okay. comes into your place. Huh. So it's inevitable, but I'm real I'm really scared to see if there's any when I get back. I mean, we turned your room upside down to look for that spider and we never <laughs> found it and I was like, "Where did it go? Did <laughs> do we eat it?" I don't think he would have. Oh. I feel like he would have like swatted at it. Um <laughs> the other thing that and like this is almost embarrassing to admit. But in in your in your uh, explanation to what happened at Halloween Horror Nights, you said flip the switch, and do you know what I immediately thought of? TikTok. You knew it. <laughs> I have a problem. I have a real problem. <laughs> I am fully obsessed with TikTok, and not only am I fully obsessed with scrolling through it, but now I'm also desperate to get good at making TikTok videos, and I suck at it. I like the Dewey one that you made. I- the Dewey ones seem the Dewey ones seem to be the ones like I feel like because like you know people are always giving ticks tick TikTok tips like how to be successful at TikTok and the one that I see the most is like like don't don't stop trying but then follow what you're good at and just stick to it and I feel like my TikTok account should just be Dewey's. <laughs> Dewey Dewey is a great TikToker, especially the one you know with the shaking head. Yeah, that was that's my that's my top favorite. One. I have a I have a Mr. Rogers one that I'm I'm gonna post I think right after this. So do keep it. An eye out for that. But, but like us exchanging TikToks has been one of my favorite things. It's the best thing. I haven't been on there for like a few days, so I need to go back on and like check it out. I only do it when I get like a notification from one of my like people I follow on on yeah, TikTok. Yeah which is not very many. So when I saw yours and I was like, oh, <laughs> but I, I like the one that you did with your dad. The which one? Not, not the fridge one, but the one oh, in the, they were he was walking like, the dog. With the, oh, when he's walking the dog and he's wearing the Halloween mask. I like that one too. I thought that was so clever. And that was so good. It doesn't do anything. I think I have consistently found one thing to be true. The TikToks I make that I find the funniest aren't the ones that get the most views. <laughs> Really? Then I'll make one and I think it's stupid and bad. And those are the ones that'll get the most views. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get Always how it happens. With that from JG Cars. We've got, if theaters don't open and most movies are postponed, do you think we will not see the Oscars until 2022 and include the few films from 2020 with 2021? 
Well, that's oh. an interesting point. I forget what the latest was on the status of the Oscars. I a very recent statement where it was the the merging of the sound categories, and I forget specifically what they said about this year's awards. So they said that they would let VOD titles be able to basically qualify to be nominated for an Oscar, but they must have had um, scheduled a release. So like Trolls World Tour would be qualified for like Best Animated, but like bad education wouldn't be because well, it yeah. never hit theaters, which is kind of a bummer because I love that movie. Um, and then they said that once theaters reopened, they will continue to do that. But movies that hadn't hit theaters then must re- like schedule like a seven day release in the theaters. So you knew all of the details because I think that's all that that was like all the bullet points. <laughs> that was yeah. Like I remember, like, I was so like shocked that the Oscars actually made a change, and I was like, oh. What? Yeah. <laughs> We're making changes. We're bound to make more changes. I think yeah. this is going to have like major long term effects here. But yeah, like you pretty much you you got it all there because now I'm I'm glancing over the Collider dot com article here. But bad education was really good. And I, while I was very excited to see that it had gotten picked up out of Toronto, I was a little disappointed that it went to HBO because that already that immediately put it in the Emmy category and not Oscars. And yeah. I don't know. I guess it's just because like I swing to the film side. I wanted it to get some Oscar nominations, but do you feel like films that would have, that premieres at film festivals, such as like a TIFF or South by Southwest should have a shot at the Oscars, regardless if it's, you know, VOD or theater released. It's yeah. I mean, like I'm, as much as I value the theatrical experience, I understand that the system works in a way that not every film gets the opportunity to screen on the big screen. And it's not its not a reflection on the quality of the movie. It's more so, you know, the resources and the connections that they have. So I am of the mind that anything that fits the feature film format should be eligible. Yeah, but I agree with that. I, like, I, I also understand why we need to have certain rules in order to preserve the theatrical experience. And also then you can get into the debate of, well, are these movies being created with the intention to screen them on the big screen? And it's like what the what the filmmaker originally wanted for their movie. Mm-hmm. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of gray area in there, but I don't know. I, I'm very curious to keep an eye on the situation, to keep monitoring it and see see what happens. Because even though they say one thing today, I'll bet you anything that in you know, a week we'll have a completely different state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> All right. Wendy, I kept you way longer than I told you I would, but we've had so many viewers and so many great questions. This was so fun. Before I give you a proper goodbye, let's slip into some quick Patreon thanks, because I owe very many of them. This is a great group here. We have Kavi, Neil, and Seth. And I'm going to repeat the same statement about these next three here, but, but all three of these guys have been part of the Patreon team for a while. And... I made a, Wendy, I don't know if you know this, but I made a Slack channel for my Patreon members who are on a certain tier or above. And Aww. it's just like the coolest community ever. And and these three are very active in it. And so are these. We've got Caleb, Stephen, and Ian. And I, like, I really, I, I hope you guys know how much it means to me that you guys are a part of that group because now is the time to have communities like that, movie and TV loving communities, and also sports. We've got a sports channel and a pets channel, and you guys seriously brighten my day every single day. So thank you for supporting the channel, but more importantly, thank you for being you and sharing your interests with me. Wendy, you are the best. I'm so Aww. happy we got to do this. Me I needed too. to see your face. I needed to see your face and talk movies with you, and I needed an update on the pups. How's Dustin doing? Everything good? Dustin's good. He's uh still still having his little his he's still getting his beauty sleep. Uh, which now I'm I'm happy that I'm I'm actually really happy I'm up because there's so much that I have to get done today that I'm just like and each day you know how it's kind of hard where you don't have to like, you know set you your or you're essentially setting your own office hours. So I'm just kind of like ah, I can wake up a little bit later or if I take out the dogs I was like ah, I can go back to sleep and then later I'm like I didn't get anything done today. So um, this is actually really, really good. This is the perfect way to start my weekend. I miss your face so much. I know. We have to do this again soon, okay? Yes, 100%. Guys, thank you so much for watching this. And again, a big thanks to Wendy for being here because she is the best. 
in case you don't already follow her, I have her Twitter information and the movie couple channel information in the comments below. Uh oh. Someone oh, we got to get this one. Another super chat. I legit have the end broadcast button queued up, but I'm <laughs> go. All right. Louis. Oh, no, I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm sorry. Louis Carizales? Caris Carizales? I think the second one. I think it might be the second one, too. Hey, Perry, what are your thoughts on the live action remake of Hercules produced by the Russo brothers? I'm glad that this question got in because there is no better person to ask this question to than Wendy. How do you Zero feel hero, just like that. Uh, I am so excited to see, to hear about the Hercules live action. I think sometimes it's one of the more underrated movies. And the fact that it's being produced by the Russo brothers, and I think this is going to go under their production company, I think it's AGBO. The same company that did Extraction, if you haven't seen that, uh -huh. you should. Because the action is unlike anything I've ever seen before, the way that was shot. Um, so Hercules would involve a lot of fighting and a lot of, you know, CGI creatures for the underworld. And I think Russo's being um, a dynamic duo that have done, you know, um, movies with multiple, multiple cast members can take on Hercules very easily make it look extremely cinematic and make the underworld look fantastic and like really flesh out the storyline. And I like to see how they're going to handle, well, one, if they choose to keep the songs in Hercules, um, because it could be a similar, similar situation to Mulan where, you know, they wanted to focus on like, you know, the family pride and the aspect of war. So they took the, the, the performances, uh, musical performances out of it. They could do the same thing in Hercules. They couldn't. I love to keep the songs, but I said the same thing about Mulan, and then I'm okay with them not having the songs in there. So we can go either way. Uh, I am thrilled at this news, and I cannot wait. Yeah, I, I express that same excitement. I, I just, like, I know some of the live-action adaptations have been better than others, but, again, I like seeing companies try to take creative swings, and... You know, no matter how you feel about The Lion King, there were a lot of technical achievements in that movie that could pave the way to others trying to do the same and build upon it. And I think, you know, some of the some of the storytelling possibilities with changing something for the live action format, but also further embracing certain themes and ideas and, and you know, not necessarily doing exactly what was done in respect to the music in the animated ones. I think it, it just, it leaves you in a place where there's great potential. I have one more question for you about Hercules, Wendy, before we end this. If you had a fan cast, the title role, who's it going to? Uh, oh, okay. I was thinking about this last night, actually, because like I was going down my, my, my Twitter feed and I was like, oh, people are fantasy casting. Um, for Pain and Panic, I would love to see if they're going to be little CGI little dudes. Um, I love to see Key and Peele do this because I saw that one. Yeah, yeah because of how they were in with uh, as Ducky and Buddy, that would be really great. I was thinking, okay, for adult Hercules, and I don't know what aids are going to go. That for, was one of my biggest questions. Who is, I can't think of it right now, um, Toby, the the actor that you like a lot. Toby, Toby. Toby yes, as Hercules. <laughs> I would never say no to that and you know it. <laughs> Him as Hercules, but then the age differential between the person I would want to cast as Megara would be completely too great. So I probably would ax that all together okay. because I kind of want to see Ariana Grande as Megara because she sang the song okay. for like the Disney sing along and she did fantastic. I would be into that. Or Zendaya. Also, oh, I, well, I'll cast Zendaya in absolutely anything. I really do think she is extremely talented, but back to Ariana Grande. So you remember, you remember how I made that feature film Child Eater? Yeah. So the short film that we made before it that paved the way to the full feature, one of the young stars in it was in that Nickelodeon show with Ariana Grande. So I was Victorious? Watching... No, the the spin-off one. Oh, okay, okay. I can't remember the name of it, but I purposely watched that show to try to, you know, support him and I wanted to know what he was working on. And she drove me nuts in that show. That character <laughs> it was making my ears bleed. I couldn't stand it. And I understand I'm not the target audience for a show like that. <laughs> oh no. But <laughs> Most recently, I saw her perform some songs for Wicked, and I know we've been talking about a Wicked adaptation for a very, very long time, and she's so good that, I don't know, I'm starting to think that maybe I would fan cast her in that as well. Yeah, yeah she's, she's fantastic. fantastic. Um, I wouldn't want her to play the muses. Um, Thanks, Pretty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So I can get behind that. The the first person that popped in my head for a Hercules type role is is someone like Noah Centineo. <laughs> Like again, I'm not fully convinced that he's he's got great range because I haven't seen enough of his work. But like for for whatever reason, when all of those uh, Hercules images from the animated movie started flooding the internet, my mind immediately connected the dots between the two of them. Ooh, that's a good yeah. fantasy casting. It could Ooh. be. Yeah, know. we'll yeah. see. Oh, I like that. We'll see. Would it also be funny if somehow they got The Rock to play, not Hercules, not Hercules because he's done that, but for him to play Zeus? Again, I, I would <laughs> test The Rock in just... In anything. <laughs> I, I really do want to see Dwayne Johnson. To, and, like, I don't even know if this is of interest to him, and I'm a big believer that stars should sign on to things that they're passionate about and excited about, but I would love to see his range more and see him do a grounded drama. I don't I know. That. I just yeah. want to see what he could do in a role like that and in a film like that. He could totally do it. I think I, he's so I like 100% committed. Yeah, in yeah. everything he does. Yeah. All right, guys. You got you got an extra half hour today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here for this whole chat. It's so great to see your face. I this hope is so you fun. All stay safe and well. Send my love to Dustin and the pups. Guys, thank you for watching this edition of my Saturday live stream. I will see you next week for another one.